yet another general principle that should be recalled is that one thing I, I hear operating here or experience operating here is people's, and this is off what you said about dangerous ideas or adjacently dangerous ideas that need to be reclaimed. There are many scary ideas, Amy you mentioned eugenics or ideas in that area as one, which are not obviously false, but which many people find deeply scary, offensive, unnerving. And people have to recognize, and this is just a principle of intellectual honesty, that we have to we have to plant a flag here and always be able to point back to the flag and keep the conquered ground. People have to recognize that merely being offended or worried isn't a counterargument. It isn't a deep reason not to think about something or or discover whether or not something is true or useful. So one's offense is not an argument. And that's something that not knowing allows people to just stigmatize views they don't like without ever feeling the the need internally on their side to produce a counterargument or to produce counter evidence. They just don't like the way something sounds or they have mistaken it for some adjacent thing that is you know, superficially similar to it that they also don't like and against which they, they probably also don't have a good argument. That was taken from a recent podcast that Sam Harris did, his most recent one from Waking Up, his uh, series of podcasts that he produces every now and then. And I'm not going to recount the entirety of the podcast. It was fairly interesting. I didn't agree with everything. went over uh, two hours. But what he said there, I think, is quite pivotal and quite relevant and quite topical. We're now beginning, slowly but surely, to see a change in the direction of the wind, as it were. A change in what people are willing to talk about and discuss, and a desire to perhaps understand things, irrespective of the offense they may cause. And this is something that we've been doing, say, in certain subsectors of MGTOW circles for a long time. And what I want to propose here is that slowly but surely we are working towards what can only be called a unified theory of the human. What makes the human being tick? In order to get there, however, we need to take into account uh, a vast host of variables and, and factors and all kinds of things. So if you remember back in the day when it was still, uh, well, it still is actually a bit of forbidden knowledge and forbidden fruit and, and of course, uh, frowned upon to talk about female nature. Uh, but, you know, in a couple of years back, it was even more so the case. People said, no, 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 don't talk about female nature because it might paint women in unflattering uh, portrait and it might paint women in a bad light. We don't want to have that. that. We can't talk about that. And most MGTOW-minded men were on board with exploring this uh, regardless and pushing forward. Now, unfortunately, women aren't the only... Women are an incredibly important puzzle of the human dynamic and this human picture, which is to say reproduction is just essential to understanding everything that human beings do. But one thing I've been doing reasonably recently, within the last year or so, is examining more and more and in greater depth uh, genetic differences between populations and talking about these things. And it was interesting, people have largely left me alone now, but in, certainly in MGTOW circles, you know, to see MGTOW-minded men sort of recoil away from this along the lines of, well, say whatever you want uh, about women, but you know, don't talk about genetic differences between genetic populations, or to use the political term, a racist. Because, you know, it might paint certain genetic populations uh, in a bad light, once again. Not too dissimilar. And there are various groups that are willing to give the green light to one, but not the other. But very few people are willing to give the green light to both. And this shows and bespeaks, to my mind, a sense of ideological purpose behind investigating these phenomena and behind exploring these issues, which is to say the people who take issue with one or the other for specific reasons almost take issue for ideolo almost exclusively for ideological reasons or because it conflicts with certain goals of the ideology. This is a problem 
Now, I don't claim to be a perfect human being. I'm incredibly fallible, and I'm pretty unremarkable in my cognitive abilities and, and many, many other regards. And I'm certainly a person who has biases. We all have biases. But there is a difference, I think, between having a pronounced ideological bias versus being a human and subject to you know, whatever biases you might have. I think the best way to illustrate this difference is to take something you know, fairly extreme and obvious. Let's say someone is a devout Christian, right, and uh, proclaims his belief in some omnipotent creator who sent his son to some shithole desert strip uh, approximately 2,000 years ago, who turns out he's, he is his son and all these other weird things, and he performs some magic tricks, and you know he watches over humanity uh, everywhere when you're taking a shit, when you're spanking off, and you know when you're in the shower. Well, and he says, I believe all of this stuff and biblical prophecy. And now I'm going to look for the data and the information and the evidence to support my position. Or now I'm going to look at some data. There's a difference between that position and the position of, look, to the best of my knowledge, I don't have any particular stake in some sort of ideological race. I'm just trying to understand things and that position. And the same is true, frankly speaking, of white nationalism and some aspects of MGTOW, and I'm critical of both. Uh, you look, for example, at some of the things, I mean, I've gotten discussions with some of these people, uh, particularly white nationalists, who they're not even necessarily claiming to be objective, but they will, they're kind of like this religious person who's looking for data to back up their position. And once again, I'm not perfect. We all have our biases. But having a, pr a pronounced ideological bias, which is to say, I want society to look like this. I want you know this people to, to do that and, and these people not to do that. And that is approaching a problem and a set of data, quite frankly speaking, uh, from a heavily biased perspective and a heavily biased position. And that doesn't necessarily make the data that is brought up uh, that are brought up rather incorrect, but it does make you curious as to the motivations and oftentimes uh, an unwillingness and a certain unyielding inflexibility in changing your position on account of new evidence. Now, of course, people will say, I always change my position on account of new evidence, but if you, if you have a preconceived notion of what the world should look like and then you look at the data, whether it's religious or or nationalist or political or whatever, that could be a potential problem. The same is true of men, certain men in the MGTOW context who find it perfectly acceptable to examine female nature because it suits their particular ideological purpose, but find it unacceptable to explore human genetic differences. And by the way, many in the alt-right find it unacceptable to explore female differences between men and women because they're allegedly inconsequential. But in years of exploration, I think we've, and, and masses of, of evidence, we've more or less pointed out that reproduction is the, the name of the game. And understanding the pronounced differences between men and women is absolutely critical if you want to understand the fulcrum, as it were, of human civilization and what drives it and how it works. So here at this channel, I try to explore these issues, to the best of my ability, unfettered by a particular ideological bent. I try to look at the data and draw conclusions from what I see. And I think there are other people who do this too. CS is like that. Coltane is like that. Um, I don't have a stake in a particular, a particular ideological race. And a guy like Sam Harris actually does, I think. I think he's you know, heavily left-leaning. He's extremely gynocentric. But at the very least, he strikes me as a person who's willing to look at evidence and change his position. He claims as much, and, and he makes it a high priority, at least in his rhetoric. But what we are working towards in the long run, I think, is a unified theory of, of human being and human existence. What makes societies uh, flourish? What is the optimal setup? What is genetically optimal, for example? That's another question that is you cannot... <laughs> really pose in the open in academic circles. These are things that are incredibly important questions to ask, and yet uh, in the mainstream we don't see very much of it, and so we have to do it. We have to do so much of the groundwork here 
uh, in the trenches, uh, lay people by and large. But I think we are moving closer, slowly but surely, to a, a picture that is more complete. We spent years analyzing and taking apart female nature, and I continue to do so on this channel to varying degrees. And now the challenge is to understand, I think, at least prioritize slightly, what are the components of, say, genetics and human civilization, uh, of course, we can't forget gender dynamics and what have you, that allow us to flourish as human beings that will essentially get, get us to escape velocity. You know, what will be the optimal outcome for human beings? Now, if we go into this question tarnished uh, by some ideological bent, whether it's r left or right or religious or some sort of race nationalism or whatever, you know, there's a problem. So, for example, one of the ideas I've, uh, pretty, I pretty much am settled on is that to advance the human race, one, one of the best genetic options you might have is for uh, heavy interbreeding between Northeast Asians and European populations. For one thing, you would diversify um, the populations and make them less susceptible to autosomal recessive disorders. And you would take uh, two high IQ populations and uh, mix them up, and you would combine certain aspects. And I, like I said, I'm going to be exploring uh, some of these no notions of uh, East Asian collectivism and the genetics related to it in a future video, but you probably would come up with a, essentially a better human being. Um, you would have a more genetically diverse portfolio. You would still have uh, a very intelligent uh, human being. Now, that's not particularly politically correct to say. But then again, that's not even politically correct to say in, say, alt-right circles because it's, that's race mixing. Well, I don't give a shit about race mixing. I care about po positive outcomes. What is the best outcome for humanity? So I think combining attributes of two high-IQ high IQ genetic populations uh, is a, you know, that's a good thing. And I think something that people should strive for. If I actually gave a shit, for example, about reproduction, and wanting to pass on my seed and all of this stuff, I would almost certainly do it with a Northeast Asian because that would optimize, I think, uh, many results and it would mollify and reduce some of the weaknesses, uh, genetically speaking. So these are the kinds of things I'm interested in. I'm not interested in some particular ideological bent, but you know what's going to produce the smartest, most effective human being? Because we need smart and effective human beings to get us off this rock to reshape society and to move slowly but surely, and hopefully more quickly than slowly, to a type one civilization. Um, but unfortunately, there are so many barricades, and this is why it's so critical to get away from any preconceived ideological notion. Now, you could argue that my idea of trying to find the optimal combination of things, optimal genetics, uh, creating you know more intelligent human beings, that this in itself is an ideology, and I suppose, but the difference is whatever the data tell me and however they're interpreted, that will guide me in, in pursuing that particular goal and in pursuing uh, how one best approach that goal. So I think there is a, a huge difference there. But it is very encouraging to see someone like Sam Harris um, in the open talk about these things and say, look, it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. Um, we cannot be concerned with the unflattering and the offensive and w whatever group you might, might belong to. It doesn't really matter. There are much more important stakes here. One of the reasons why I get so upset with all this Islamic nonsense is because these people are holding us back and in all manner, for all manner of reasons, the religion, the culture, the low IQs. Uh, I don't want that to be part of European civilization because it, it's not going to propel us forward. I care about outcomes. I want human beings to become more intelligent. I want us to uh, forge a better world. I want better technology. I want better medicine. I want all of these things. And you can't do that with medieval barbarism. And you can't do that with political correctness. So in that spirit, and in the spirit of that snippet that I showed at the beginning, I think what we also need to 
reappraise of some of these earlier investigations of things, you know, quote unquote eugenics. But what does that really mean? It just means optimal uh, genetic results. What I was proposing just earlier was quote unquote eugenics, right? Um, Crossbreeding Northeast Asians with uh, European populations. So I, you know, that's not politically correct, as I said, but you know, we need to sort of reclaim these terms free to the best of our ability of any ideological bent. I don't, uh, yeah, of course, I'll be accused of having some sort of East Asian fetish. No, I just see certain characteristics in that population, uh, cognitive mostly, that are desirable. And I also see certain characteristics in European populations that are desirable for those outcomes. And frankly speaking, you know, if there were some tribe in Shmugabuga in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that consistently, you know, showed IQs of 130 and they uh, developed a steam engine in, in 1400 and, you know, I'd be for that. I'd be for, you know, getting those people on board too. Whatever gets the results, uh, that's what interests me. Um, and I think this is something, generally speaking, that most of the people that I collaborate with, such as CS, and I suppose to a lesser degree, Coltane, because he's, he's a sort of left of center guy, uh, can get on board with. Now, on a, on a final note, and talking about moving towards a unified theory of the human, what I'd like to do uh, in a couple of years' time, possibly, and maybe even sooner than that, assuming life, sustenance, income, and domicile, is to finally get a website up where the website becomes a repository of this knowledge. Knowledge about women, men, genetic differences in populations, all of this can be researched and looked up on this theoretical website. A collaborative work of several different people, perhaps. But in doing so, we can do what academia tends to not do very well because it's limited by funding and limited by ideological bias. We can come up, uh, perhaps, with a compendium of all the most relevant aspects of human nature that are so essential to building an optimal society. At this point in time, we have a lot of hints, we have a lot of indications, but we're still not entirely clear on the picture of what makes an optimal society uh, and what doesn't. There are strong, strong indications. There are also you know, indications the other way. We know what doesn't make an optimal society. Um, so, for example, to have an optimal society, you don't want people with low IQs, generally speaking. Um, that would preclude uh, people, those people from really contributing and participating heavily in the societies, things of that nature. That's not particularly uh, nice to say, I suppose, but... You know, that's what the data tell us. You know, IQ is an extremely relevant factor and the greater factor of G. But I think I'm going to draw this to a close here, ladies and gentlemen, and just say, look, as we move on, we are increasingly going to be gathering more information and we're going to be moving towards this unified theory of the human. However unflattering women and certain minorities or majorities for that matter are... Uh, are are painted. It's, it doesn't really matter. We need to press on with the knowledge. We need to press on with the understanding because uh, time is not on our side. It most certainly is not. We've been stumbling through history for untold millennia. It's time to stop stumbling. And it's time to move forward in a consequential and directed manner. And I think uh, personally, this is the way forward. And that is what I uh, strive and endeavor to do on this channel and will do so in the future, hopefully, assuming I'm still alive. So everyone, Thank you for tuning in and take care and enjoy the rest of your week. Bye-bye. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.